Okay, let's do this. Why not? Good uh, afternoon, evening, morning, I don't know. Um, my name is Alvaro Sanchez. Uh, I'm going to do a, um, a presentation about the cloud native features of uh, Micronaut. Um, who's been on any of my earlier presentations already? <laughs> Almost everybody, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Uh, you've probably had enough of myself today. Um, uh, just a brief introduction for the ones who doesn't know me and also for the video. Um, I'm coming from Madrid, Spain. Uh, I belong to the OCI team uh, working in, in Grails and Micronaut. Uh, and at the bottom of every slide, you have my, my Twitter handle. Uh, in case you want to say something, um, only compliments and then positive things, please. No, I'm, I'm kidding. Just uh, express uh, whatever feedback uh, you have. It'll be useful for me. So, uh, th this session, because th this morning I did an introductory session about the framework, so I don't want to repeat myself. Who's, who's been on that session? Um, Introductory one, okay, almost everybody. Yeah, w a, bit, a bit quickly here. Um, yes, Micronaut is a new framework, you probably already know that. Um, it combines the productivity of uh, Spring Boot and Grails plus the performance of a compile time uh, framework. Um, it is reactive, based on Netty. Uh, we support uh, Maven and Gradle, uh, Java, Groovy, and Kotlin, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, the way we do this is using AOT, a Helstein compilation, which means that all the most of the framework infrastructure is compute at compile time using annotation processors for Java and Kotlin and HT transformations for Groovy. Um, which means that, for instance, all the dependency injection, configuration, uh, passing. Uh, the annotation metadata, um, everything happens at compile time. So uh, Micronaut is 99% uh, reflection free. Uh, Micronaut is uh, suitable for uh, building any kind of applications. You can build microservices or REST APIs is the most common use case, but you can use it by any for any other uh, use cases, like for instance, a uh, serverless application, uh, like a AWS Lambda function, or, or a Kafka uh, application with no REST API, or a CLI application with no server at all. Um, uh, in Android, you can use it uh, everywhere. Um, but this particular session is about the cloud-native features of Micronaut, uh, which are the distributed configuration, service discovery, uh, client-side load balancing, distributed tracing, and functions. Uh, so if you think about Micronaut, we released, mic we open sourced Micronaut for the first time um, one year ago at GreatConf 2018. Um, so it's only one year of, op of open source, the project, the, the actual development is a little bit earlier than that. But the open source happened uh, one year ago here. Uh, but we already are production uh, ready. The latest release is 112. Uh, there is an upcoming, there will be frequent releases for the 11X line, and there will be a 12 release um, anytime soon. Um, if you think about the current uh, features that the framework has, and you compare that to, to the Spring ecosystem or the Grails ecosystem, you can think of uh, the current state of, of Micronaut like Spring plus Spring Boot plus Spring, Spring Cloud plus Spring Security, right? Um, so many of the things we're going to talk about here are already um, present in Fresno Spring Cloud, right? So uh, we do support uh, that as well. Um, for the things that you can see in this slide. Um, the key part of this um, cloud native support is based on the environment class. Uh, the environment class is 
um, the immaculate way to determine what it's running and what is the configuration available. Um, so the environment is cloud platform aware. Uh, we, by default, will do our best effort to detect in which cloud provider we are running. And that is, um, well, I'll tell you the list of uh, providers supported. Um, this is great for using the metadata API, uh, but it can be turned off if you don't want that. Um, it, it is, so we do as much as we can to detect the environment using the fastest available method. Um, for instance, in, in DigitalOcean, uh, it requires to read a file, which is faster than making an HTTP request to the metadata API. But uh, even though you know the the uh, metadata API in the cloud providers are you know are like a special endpoints in the network that are faster than any other ones, uh, we support already quite a few cloud environments. Um, <coughs> Amazon, Google, um, yeah, Heroku, DigitalOcean, IBM Cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, um, and also Kubernetes in different ways, which, which I will explain later. Um, so um, the first use case is to use the, the metadata API of those providers. So uh, you know for Google Cloud, for AWS, for Oracle, for DigitalOcean, they all have a metadata API that will give you information about the instance running, right? Uh, it'll give you information about the availability zone, the region, uh, image ID, uh, network interfaces, public and private IP addresses, uh, v4 and v6, so uh, the host name, public and private, uh, there's plenty of information you can read that and we, ma we make that available for you um, in a consistent way. So essentially there is a compute instance metadata uh, VIN that you can read from the, from the embedded server and um, uh, depending on which cloud provider this is running, um, it'll, uh, it'll query you know, whatever uh, metadata API is the cloud provider offering <coughs> and will populate the information for you. Um, the other useful um, the other useful thing about the cloud provider detection is for for environment aware configuration, right? Um, when you deploy a micronet application into any of those clouds, um, by default we will activate um, the environment.cloud environment. When I, when I talk about environment, I'm talking about this class, right? So, uh, well, there's actually a, a, an enum. So we will activate the cloud environment. So you can have uh, an application dash cloud.yaml file for um, when the application is running generally in the cloud. But you can also do, for instance, application dash AWS or application dash uh, GCP, or application dash um, Oracle Cloud, right? So, and th that configuration will only be read when the particular environment is active. We will make it active by default by, by detecting it, right? Um, you can switch it off, this environment detection, if you want to, and you can also, um, you can also, um, uh, manually specify any other environment, right? If you, you know, for whatever reason you wanted to do it like that, you can actually activate uh, multiple environments. So uh, you have, like, for instance, the cloud environment and the AWS environment, but uh, you can switch also a production environment, right? So and have a, another application specific uh, configuration file. The first cloud native uh, feature we support is distributed configuration. The idea of distributed configuration is that in a microservices uh, architecture, um, or actually, if you if you if you're coming from the monolith architecture, you're used to have your configuration inside your application, and that was fine when we were creating monoliths. But uh, we're no longer creating monoliths, right? Nobody here is creating monoliths. Everybody is doing microservices. 
um, and um, configuration is a challenge because uh, there's sometimes um, configuration values which are which should be uh, distributed across different microservices, right? So, so it is it is a it is a complex problem, but fortunately, it's, it is a solved problem already. So you don't have to think about it because it's been solved already by the industry. Uh, and the solution to that problem is to use uh, service discovery servers, um, like for instance, Console or Eureka uh, or anything like that, right? The idea is that when you have a service, service discovery um, service discovery server, those servers will also allow you to store configuration values, right? Depending on which um, server we're talking about, they, they will have a different API. Uh, the good news again is that Micronaut will, um, will trip them all in a consistent manner, so you don't have to. Um, so the building block for a configuration in Micronaut is uh, a class called property source. By the way, this is the same name as in Spring. Um, so if you're familiar with, this, with the property source API in Spring, uh, it is pretty much the same in Micronaut. Uh, a property source is essentially um, a source of configuration properties, right? Um, you can figure that in bootstrap.yaml because um, uh, the bootstrap.yaml is is read actually before the application context is created, uh, and the reason why um, is because um, you know the actual distributed configuration can influence the way the application context is created. Like for instance, uh, you can tell an instance uh, which environment should should load or or anything like that. So we need to have a pre um, well, essentially bootstrap file to do this configuration. Um, uh, property sources are composable, and uh, application will normally have multiple ones, because uh, property sources can come from many different places. Um, they can come from command line arguments, uh, and I think I actually have the in precedence order. So, um, so for instance, if I have a, if I have a, a configuration value coming from uh, from a command line argument, uh, we stop finding. So we, w we don't find anything else. So that, that'll take precedence over the others. Uh, there is also this Spring application JSON environment variable. This is something used in Spring Boot, and we support it for compatibility reasons. The value of the environment of that <coughs> particular environment variable it is a, a JSON string with the, all the configuration, right? You can do the same with the Micronaut application JSON environment variable. You can use Java system properties with minus D. Uh, you can use OS environment variables, or you can use environment specific um, configuration files. We support four different formats, uh, Java properties, JSON, YAML, and Groovy. Uh, so think, for instance, a single property called uh, Micronaut server port. Right, uh, you can provide the value for that property in uh, application.yaml, right? You can provide that in application-test.yaml, and it'll it'll be only affect when the test environment is active. You can uh, before running the application, you can uh, set the environment variable Micronaut server port with capitals and underscores, right? And it'll take precedence over any other value. Uh, you can use Java system properties. So this is an idea that there are multiple ways to provide configuration values. Uh, the configuration file is only one of the ways, but um, there are many others. Uh, once again, this is the same in Spring. But uh, I didn't mention yet anything distributed. So this is uh, for the configuration system of a single application. So how do we make this um, distributable? Um, and that, that is with the, the service discovery servers, which normally support also sharing configuration values. 
Uh, we support the ones you have there. We support console, vault, sprinkle config, uh, AWS parameter store, and Kubernetes. Let's see each of them. So console, like I said, console is a service discovery server that allows you to do not only service discovery, which we will see later, but, al but also um, configuration sharing. It is essentially a key value storage. Uh, and the different ways you can store configuration values in console. Um, by default, uh, the, you know, it is used, the key value is used. So, um, well, this is the, minim the minimum configuration you need to have. You also need to have a, um, a discovery client uh, dependency on the build. Um, my current application name will be used for service registration. So it'll register this particular application in console as, as uh, Hello Galaxy for the service ID. Uh, we are turning on the configuration client. Um, and then we're pointing to the, to the console um, URL, which by default is pointing to localhost. So uh, the console API has a, a key value REST API to store a uh, configuration, uh, starting with the slash config. Um, and there's different ways we can, you can store configuration. So in, um, in any path, console path, which is um, prefixed with slash config slash application, you will store configuration uh, for all applications. And then uh, you can append with a comma any uh, environment specific. So this is for all applications in the production environment. Then this is uh, application specific, only this application, and then only this application for this environment. Those are the combinations. So how do you store that in, conf in console? That is the slash config uh, URL, slash application, and then this is the key, right? And this is the value. So the key is foo.bar, and the value is, in this case, a string called value. How do you read it? You can read it using any of the annotations available in Micronaut to read configuration uh, values. The basic one is the add value annotation. So in this case, because of the key is um, foo.bar, that is the one we used for the add value annotation. There are all the notations, like for instance, configuration properties. So when you have multiple configuration values, um, it is actually a bad practice to have uh, like uh, five attributes in your class annotated with that value. So it is much better to create a class to annotate it with um, add configuration properties, and then uh, inject this configuration property cl uh, class wherever is needed. Um, Does this make sense for you? Uh, um, where to use the add value annotation? The, or configuration, the configuration properties? Uh, yes. Sorry. No, 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 no. I think it's. I actually have a slide for uh, for a different presentation. So. Yeah. I agree, it's better with an example. Should I have an example somewhere over here? This is it. So um, this is a configuration class we annotate with add configuration properties, and we, we give it a prefix. Um, so then in the configuration file, any property underneath my.engine will map to the attributes here. And we can use Vim validation API to put constraints on the values. So it is type safe. Th this, is, this is the way to do it. Right, it is the recommended way because it's type safe. You can apply constraints. So, add value, it's fine when you have uh, one or two values to annotate. But if it's larger than that, uh, use a configuration class. Right. 
And then uh, uh, the configuration class can be injected in any class you need. So as an alternative, um, as you can see, for instance, if you have like uh, hundreds configuration values, you'll have a lot of requests to a read and write configuration values. So this is this is not really scalable. Um, once again, you can use the, the individual key value uh, approach when you have few keys. But if you have like a large configuration file, there is a much easier approach, which is to store the whole um, configuration file, in this case it's in JSON format, but it could be YAML or, or, or properties. You can store the whole text of the configuration into a single key, into a single console, console key. And because this is application, you know it will be configuration for all the uh, applications, all the environments, right? Uh, I'm also specifying that the format is uh, JSON, right? Um, uh, the default, I think it's uh, KEV. So when I specify something else, Micronaut at this uh, Micronaut will do different queries, right? So we'll fetch the global configuration. We'll fetch, if anything, for the active environments of this application. We'll fetch. We'll do. Several, several combinations queries to console to read all the configuration values. We'll create all the property sources and we'll give them a precedence uh, accordingly, right? So, for instance, application specific configuration um, will, you know, will take precedence over global configuration, which are like fallbacks and things like that. Yep. Um, but uh, still, this is not perfect because then. You know, there is. You need to have a way to have a um, versioned um, configuration files. So this is back practice, actually, because where are you going to maintain this information, right? Uh, are you going to have like a different repo or something like that? So uh, it, it isn't uh, ideal. So when you have a lot of configuration for a lot of different services, what people do normally is use uh, something like Git to console. Uh, with Git console, uh, the idea is that you have a different repo for the configurations uh, for your applications, right? And Git to console is a standard tool that mirrors that configuration files into console, right? Um, because the configuration files are in a Git repo, it is great to have a versioned um, configuration file. So whenever you change a configuration value, you keep track of them. But the applications, locally, they don't have any file because they will rely on console for that, right? Um, and then there is a way to tell Micronaut that it needs to read not only um, a configuration key, but uh, any file available. So in this case, the key would be under the slash config would be application.yaml, right? And the value for that in console would be the whole YAML value. And you can have that for multiple uh, files. The next one is uh, Vault. Um, Vault is, uh, so console is written by a company called HashiCorp, uh, and, and Vault is as well. Vault is a system that can be used to store configuration values, right? So in that sense, it is, a, um, uh, it is usable for the same thing as console, but where, where Vault really shines is to store secrets, and that's actually what people use it for. Uh, and actually, normally, people use console just for the service discovery part and then use it the key value system. Uh, and for that, they use Vault. Uh, so Vault has a, um, an advanced way of sealing secrets. Uh, like for instance, database, pa database passwords or any password, any any secret value, you don't have to, you don't want to keep it uh, in clear, right? Um, at the end of the day, Vault is a server with a REST API, and the Micronaut support is a client that integrates with this server 
um, using either token authentication or certificate-based authentication. Uh, other than that, the behavior is really similar because uh, Vault also have a uh, the key value storage, they have paths, and it is the same approach, right? Uh, the only difference is that instead of using commas to, to separate environments, we are using slashes because that's the way you uh, separate environments in Vault, right? So we have a global uh, configuration uh, key values in the slash application, and then the service ID uh, for the application specific, then uh, all the applications for this environment, and this application for this environment, right? Uh, another alternative would be to use Spring Cloud Config Server. So um, if you're coming from, from a company who's done some, some Spring Boot, Spring Cloud development, you probably already have a Spring Cloud Config Server um, instance. Uh, for the ones who doesn't know, a Spring Cloud Config Server is a tiny Spring Boot application um, designed to store configuration values, right? Um, uh, we support it by default. Uh, this is actually done by a community contribution, um, which is great. Uh, and once again, it is a way to, to, put to contribute more property sources. So if you think about what I, what I said before, remember that you have all the property sources we saw before coming from um, environment variables, from configuration files, plus any property source contributed by a configuration client, right? And you can, have, you can combine them all. Um, it shouldn't be uh, any interest in doing that, but potentially you could say, I want configuration from both console and Vault and Spring Cloud Config, so you could do that. Another option we support is uh, AWS uh, Parameter Store. That's uh, the way, that's the AWS way to store um, configuration values. Uh, it isn't straightforward because, um, well, it's, it's AWS, so you need to go through the console and you need to uh, you need to have a key managed system uh, key for your account, and using that key, it is um, it will be used to to encrypt your secret values. But at the end of the day, um, AWS will offer an API to query those configuration values. Uh, AWS also offers the UI, both the console UI or a CLI command to to create them, to read them. And what we do at Micronaut is to allow you to, uh, we will use the AWS uh, Java SDK to read the values and, and create a property source for it. Uh, we support reading um, string values, uh, string list values, and secure string uh, values. Those are types defined in the AWS Java SDK. Uh, this is the minimum configuration to get started, but there are few more things because you need dependencies, you need to and you need to do the AWS setup yourself, like I said. Kubernetes. Uh, in the case of Kubernetes, um, uh, for configuration, it is currently in development. There is a uh, new module where I'm actually working on that module myself. Um, it allows you to read configuration values from Kubernetes config maps and secrets, right? Um, you can use YAML and Java properties. Uh, and I think JSON too. So you know, in Kubernetes, you can create, there is a custom resource definition for something called config map, uh, which, is, which is essentially like a bug where you place key values. That's, that's all about it. So um, you can create them from from literal configuration values, and you can create them from files. And what we do is to use the Kubernetes API to read those configuration values, and we make, avail we make them available as property sources. So once they are in the property source mechanism, they can be read with any way we've seen before, with add value, add configuration properties, et cetera. This is currently, this is currently in development and will be uh, made uh, available Zoom. Um, I think this should be 
the previous slide. So, well, this is the, this is actually wrong slide, so forget about this. It's probably a copy and paste. Cool. So, yeah, so that was distributed configuration. As you can see, um, the idea is that your applications will have configuration not only for local files, but also for uh, different servers that will store key values for your microservices. The next thing is how to do service discovery. So the service discovery um, problem or solution is in a microservices environment where you have uh, services that call each other, how do you tell? And actually, if you think about the cloud, it uh, makes everything much more complicated because uh, you don't have control over IPs or ports or, well, maybe for ports you do, but, uh, but for IPs you don't have control of. And, or for instance, in Kubernetes, you, you don't have control over the IPs that will get assigned to the, to the pod that will get created when you uh, do a deployment. So, so it is really necessary to do service discovery to, n to not hard code the URLs of your dependencies, right? So once again, the idea with service discovery is that we, we, um, we have services that call other services, and we want a dynamic way to tell in which IP and port are the other services listening. Uh, which ways you can use? Um, once again, you can use Console, Eureka, Kubernetes, uh, Root uh, 53, or even manual discovery. Uh, how do you do uh, service discovery in, in Micronaut? So one way, when you use the add client annotation, you can use a service ID, and then Micronaut will use the configured um, service discovery API, for instance, if it's console, it, it, it'll talk to console and say, hey, console, can you give me uh, all the instances registered under this name, under this service ID? Because there could be uh, more than one instance registered in, uh, for a given service ID. And that is useful for, you know, when you want resilience, right? So when you have multiple replicas of a microservice for, for load balancing, um, if it's actually more than one instance, Micronaut will do load balancing. We will see that later. Um, this is probably enough for the majority of the human beings, but if, if for you it's not, you can also use the Discovery Client API yourself, uh, which can give you access to the low-level uh, classes, but um, I don't think uh, you may gonna need it. Um, there's two things relevant for, th for service discovery. One is uh, auto registration, so how to register myself into the service discovery server. Um, this is the way we do. Um, in the case of console, by default, we not only register the application with an IP and port, but also we register a TTL check. So that is a way for um, the service discovery module of Micronaut to tell if an instance is uh, healthy or not. So by default, uh, a Micronaut application which has service discovery enabled will send heartbeat to console periodically. Um, there is the other way around, and is to have console uh, check periodically on your health endpoint if you're healthy, right? So uh, you can um, do both ways. In either case, if for instance, if it's Micronaut sending heartbeats, right? Uh, if for whatever reason there is one instance which is not available, it will be removed from the available instances in console and the other way around as well. Um, in the case of Eureka, Eureka is a similar service discovery um, server. It is uh, written and maintained by, by Netflix. Netflix. Um, Micron will do herbits, auto registration, and service discovery of other instances. Uh, the way it works is the same. This is the minimum configuration required. In Kubernetes, uh, there are different ways you can do um, uh, service discovery in Kubernetes. One is using DNS, which is the basic one. Um, the other one is using environment variables, which will be exposed by, by Kubernetes in the pods that will have uh, been created. But uh, there is an other alternative, and is used this library mentioned before, which is in, uh, um, in development still, 
uh, that will use the Kubernetes API to read all the services, and for each of the services, it'll read uh, the Kubernetes endpoints for it. So it'll read the IP addresses and the ports of the load balancers. So in this case, if you have a, a, a Kubernetes service deployed uh, with this given name, this will end up um, being assigned a, an IP and a and port. Well, the port is actually 880, but it will get assigned an IP. For instance, if you deploy this service in AWS, it'll create an ALV, right? ALV, uh, load balancer in, in Amazon, right? Uh, and this will give you uh, like a extremely long URL for it, but you'll have to worry about because um, uh, this library will find out. And uh, the other option is using environment variables. The problem with environment variables is that for any change, it will not reflect it in the pods uh, unless they get restarted. So it, it is flexible enough. So that's, where, that's why we're creating a, a library that uses the Kubernetes API. Uh, and the last alternative is to use uh, to fix the list of services you want to connect to. And this might be useful for tests or for, se or for uh, scenarios where there is no uh, service discovery available. Uh, in the case of client-side load balancing, the idea is really simple. So the discovery client will find instances for services. There can be many of them. By default, we perform round robin, and that's it. So you don't have to do anything else. Um, the, this uh, client-side uh, load balancer is uh, health check aware. So for instance, instances that are not passing the health check will be removed from the instances list. So um, the, the discovery client will only return available instances. Uh, if this implementation is not enough, you can replace it with your own, or you can use Netflix Ribbon. Um, in the case of distributed tracing, uh, the idea of distributed tracing is in a microservices architecture, uh, when you have a single call which is traversing different services end to end, it's somewhat complicated to, to have a, a global view of, of what happened, when, what were the microservices involved, and that is distributed tracing is for. Um, there is an open tracing standard or API which we support, and the open, tr the open tracing API uh, introduces the notion of a trace. So a trace, a trace is, a, is an end-to-end -end operation, right? And then imagine, a, imagine a, like um, a shopping cart request, which is going through the, I don't know, from the fr a front end microservice, which is in a query to the uh, orders microservice, to the billing microservice, right? So for an end to end request, for, an, for a trace operation, which will be a single operation, it can be divided into different trace, in, uh, sorry, different spans. So span is an atomic operation uh, within a trace. Uh, we support um, open tracing API annotations to specify um, th the span names. You can put tags into the spans, and then you can use either Sipkin or Jagger to, to view uh, in a beautiful way how a single operation is traversing different microservices. And um, with the tags, you can see the actual values for this. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, in terms of serverless functions, uh, which is the last thing I want to talk to you about. Um, so the idea of serverless is that you have a piece of work that you want to run, and you don't want to define any application server, uh, any compute distance. You don't want to define anything like that. You want, um, you know, the simplest definition you want literally a function, and I, when I say a function, it is Java Util Function function class from Java 8, right? In this case, it's a function because, because it takes uh, an input and an output, right? This is, a, this is the input, the ESBM validation request, and the ESBM validation response, right? So in the apply method of the function, you do your job, right? 
Uh, this is the simplest definition of a function, that is the si uh, and it's something you can do in AWS, in Google Cloud Run, uh, in Oracle probably as well. Um, so what is Micronaut giving you in this context? Um, first of all, when you use function bin, it'll turn your function class into a bin into the application context, meaning that you can use all the features you've seen before, like for instance, dependency injection, uh, you can use configuration system of Micronaut, uh, the environment of our properties. Uh, you can use all of those features in your function, which is great. Uh, so one way to create function is to use a, fu a function bin annotation, right? Uh, which then you, you need to implement any of the Java 8 function uh, utilities. So if it's a, a supplier, because it's producing but not consuming, if it's a consumer because it's consuming but not producing, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, you can also define a factory of, of function bins, right? And in Groovy, uh, you can use uh, a single script. Um, but this is a, a statically compiled script where you can use dependency injection, right? So. Um, you know that Groovy will create a, a script class underneath, but uh, this is statically compiled, uh, and you can use dependency injection, for instance, for a, for a service dependency. And um, it is as simple as defining a, a single method in the script, and this will be the function name. So imagine your application, if we go back to this example, it could be as simple as this, and a build file, and um, pretty much it. So, so how do you test this, right? The first way to test this is um, if you run the function project locally, Micronaut will create endpoints for your functions, so you can, you can invoke them as REST endpoints, which is cool, right? Uh, another way is to use the function client annotation. The function client annotation is similar to the add client annotation, but is a, uh, an annotation that will create a client for, for a function that is cloud aware. So um, if a function client is run in, in a cloud environment, it'll use, for instance, in the case of AWS, it'll use the, um, it's called the AWS um, proxy something, I forgot the name. But there is, there is a, a, pro a proxy um, API for, a, for, a, uh, for Lambda that will create endpoints on top of it, and this function client will be aware of uh, what, the, uh, what is the actual endpoint of the, of the function, right? Uh, you can use fancy things like, for instance, unretriable, uh, so your, you know, your function client can be uh, resilient. Uh, this is important because normally the first request of a function uh, might take longer because you know, you know, the function is, is called, which is uh, there's no previous executions. Uh, the underlying provider will have to spin up a container uh, which, which takes time and then uh, subsequent executions will be faster than that. Um, you can you can have function clients for remote functions which are which are not of your project. So you c could have potentially a CLI application with the only class of a function client that is invoking a remote function, right? So th this would be uh, a sort of a, um, an HTTP client, but is is function aware. So it's aware of where well, it's aware because you're telling it in this case, right? For instance, for AWS Lambda. You're telling the function name and the region, and uh, it'll use the AWS uh, API to actually determine the endpoint for this particular function. Um, you can run functions as CLI applications, and uh, this is uh, really interesting because uh, the function projects are uh, runnable jars. And are runnable jars that listen for arguments on the standard input. This is important for uh, function providers like OpenFast. You know, OpenFast is a way to, to define functions via Docker containers, and the arguments for the functions are passed as uh, standard inputs. 
and the standard output of your function is what, what is taken for the response. I have three minutes left, uh, so I've got a few links, which you probably already know. Um, there is a website, documentation. Uh, we have a lot of guides. Some of them uh, are already covering uh, serverless and functions. Um, there is a workshop that you can try to get uh, started with Micronaut. And we have a GitHub channel where we hang around uh, with the community. Um, so, um, so show up there and, and say hello. Um, other than that, uh, thank you very much for being here, and I hope you liked this talk. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? It's almost 5 p.m., I understand, so you're, you're really exhausted. You've probably had too much of me today. Um, once again, this is my Twitter handle, so uh, um, if there's any other thing you want to say or to mention, I'll be around for a few hours today. Um, do you have any question? No? Last chance? Okay, thank you very much.